I want us to have a, a self-sufficient human population somewhere other than Earth. Because 25 years of being a computer programmer has taught me the value of backing things up. Andy Weir was working as a computer programmer in Silicon Valley when he began writing The Martian in serial form and posting it for free on his personal website. Five years later, he had a book deal with Crown Publishing and a film option with 20th Century Fox. The movie, directed by Ridley Scott and starring Matt Damon, comes out this October and follows the story of astronaut Mark Watney as he struggles to survive on Mars after he's mistakenly left for dead in the wake of a botched mission. We sat down with Weir to talk about his amazing journey from programmer to best-selling author, the challenges of writing a scientifically accurate space novel, and his thoughts on the future of real-life space travel. Andy, thank you very much for talking with us. Thanks for having me. So the story behind the book itself is uh, actually almost as interesting as the book, uh, which is that you self-published the book online, and then somehow 20th Century Fox found it and adapted it into a movie starring Matt Damon. Could you just tell, uh, take us through that journey? Oh, you know, it's the same as anybody else. You know, once you self-publish something, it gets made into a movie by Ridley Scott. I always wanted to be a writer, but I also like the idea of eating regular meals and stuff. And so when the time came to choose a career, I w went into computer programming. And that's fun. I like it. Uh, but, you know, I still always wanted to be a writer. I set up my own web page for my own creative efforts. I did a bunch of web comics, short stories, stuff like that. And one thing I would post are serials. I'd post a new chapter every month, every two, two months or so. And sometimes I'd just go months at a time without working on it. And it was just a serial that I was working on. And uh, I, I put a lot of work into making it scientifically accurate because my regular readers, based on the size of my mailing list, were um, science dorks, like hard, hard, hardcore science dorks. Uh, I had about 3,000 regular readers. And I, you know, my, my web comics and stuff were geeky stuff. And so I knew that I had to be technically accurate, otherwise it would like kind of break realism uh, for them. And I never had any notion that the story would be popular in the mainstream. I thought I was, I thought this was a story by a nerd for nerds. Doing it in this serialized form and having this kind of instant feedback from this legion of nerds reading your material, do you? feel like that affected your process at all and affected your writing? Did it make you a better writer? It did because of a couple of things. Uh, first off, um, getting the feedback helped motivate me. And that's one of the biggest challenges for me anyway as a writer, and I think for others too, is actually sitting your ass down and writing. And knowing that there were people eagerly waiting for each new chapter helped really motivate me to get it done. Um, the other thing that was cool was that I had 3,000 fact checkers. So just like, there's nothing a nerd loves more than telling you you're wrong on math. And I can, I can, I can confirm this because I myself am a nerd. And so any, any math errors or whatever in the, in the chapters as I posted them, I would get emails and say like, well, you got this wrong, you got that wrong. So that really helped with the scientific accuracy. So I just kept posting chapters and eventually I finished. And when I was done, I thought like, okay, I'm done. On to other projects, other serials. And then I started to get email from my readers. They're like, hey, I, um, I, love the, I love The Martian, but I hate your site because my site sucks. And they're like, and it's no fun to read a book on a website. Can you just make an e-reader version? So I did that, and I posted it to the site. And then I got other emails from people saying, oh, hey, I'm glad there's an e-reader version, but I'm not very technically savvy, and I don't know how to download a thing from the internet and put it on my um, e-reader. Can you just post it to Amazon Kindle? So I figured out how to do that. I said, all right, folks, you can read it for free on my website, or you can pay Amazon a buck to put it on your Kindle for you. I was required to set a minimum price of 99 cents. So I set it at 99 cents, pulling down a cool 30 cents per copy royalty, I'll have you know. And I just turned it loose. And it sold like tens of thousands of copies. It was, it was selling really well, and it worked its way up to the top of the um, bestseller lists in Amazon, like the top sellers in science and stuff like that. After three years earlier in life of not being able to get an agent at all, one comes knocking at my door. I'm like, sure. And within a couple of weeks, um, David had me on the phone with Random House and working on a book deal. And so while they were negotiating that, Fox came for the film rights. By the way, at this time, I'm a computer programmer. 
So I'm here, like, I'm in my cubicle working on bugs and then sneaking off to a conference room to take a, a call about my movie deal, then back to my cubicle, fix more bugs. Wow, that is incredible. And what is the lesson that you take away from going through that process? I've put a lot of work into trying to figure out what the hell did I do right? Because I'd like to do that again. Right. I, <laughs> I, don't, I, I did not expect it to have mainstream appeal. And the only thing I can think of is that I think as just as a society, people are more educated on science than ever before, and so they can appreciate um, more detailed science fiction. So I think that your book, in a way, represents the kind of mass popularization of science. You're wearing a shirt right now that says, I'm going to science the something out of this. <laughs> yes. uh, could you uh, explain why you're wearing the shirt and, and what you think about um, the public's attitude towards science uh, in 2015. Well, this is a line from the movie. It's actually, uh, Drew came up with this line. It's not in the book. Uh, so uh, people often credit me with this quote, but it's not. It's, it's, it's a quote from Drew Goddard. And, um, well, it's a quote from Mark Watney as written by Drew Goddard. And uh, it pretty much sums up the, the entire book and movie of The Martian. Uh, science in popular culture is getting more and more popular. It used to be science, or whatever were just nerds that were kind of marginalized by society and I, that's no longer the case now there's like geek chic type stuff yeah. um, and I don't mean the brand name I mean <laughs> yeah. but I mean we have but, like celebrity scientists mm -hmm. now we have yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson exactly. and, um, Bill Nye Richard Dawkins how do you feel about science as a sort of cultural force I love it I, lo I love that people are starting to um, like ha ha uh, respect and venerate uh, academic and scientific achievement because that makes your society smarter over time. It means that it means that like kids growing up now will now grow up in a society where it's like, oh look, that guy who's like smart and scientific minded is cool. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I want to do that. And I honestly think a large part of that. I mean, this is like kind of cynical of me, but a large part of that is um, I think comes from the software industry, and where I spent 25 years of my life. And people only started to like nerds when nerds started to make triple the median income. All of a sudden, like, along with the tech boom came a bunch of, like, wealthy nerds. Then all of a sudden, society's like, oh, nerds are neat. I like so nerds. Now Much nerds are out. rolling in it. Now nerds are rolling in it. And right. ignoring the anomalous, like, super successful you know, Bill Gates guys, but just talking about the average computer programmer makes, you know, well over $100,000 a year. And it's like, all of a sudden, nerds are cool. In a uh, past Q&A, you described your politics as socially liberal and fiscally conservative. Do you consider yourself a libertarian? Not like a capital L libertarian at all. Small uh, libertarian. I guess. I, I generally try to steer clear of uh, discussing politics at all. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think about my political views when they're reading my book. Why is that? Why is it that you don't like, that you, you kind of consciously avoid inserting any of that into your writing? If I'm reading a book about a dude stranded on Mars, I don't want, I, I don't want some you know agenda involved in the book, and it, and it ruins the story for me, because you sit there and go like, uh, it isn't just like not only is the author preaching at me, but the universe of this book is going to align to validate his point of view, right. and it ruins things. It's like I okay, I already know who the good guys and the bad guys are going to be. I already know that like this guy can't be the murderer because the author is making this political point mm. or whatever. Robert Zubrin, who's president of the Mars Society, um, he wrote an article that was actually published in Reason asking the blunt and somewhat uncomfortable question, how much is an astronaut's life worth? And Zubrin's question, to be clear, is not asking about a rescue situation per se, but about precautionary measures, because there's kind of an unlimited amount of money that you could spend, because you can never reach perfect safety. At what point do we stop spending money and actually send someone up out of the atmosphere into this horrible, scary <laughs> vacuum called outer space. Do you think it's possible for governments to adequately balance those two concerns? It's absolutely possible, and I think they do it. Um, and a, a really good example of how governments do it isn't so much with um, astronauts, but with air travel. So governments have to decide what are the requirements for aircraft. Like what, you know, okay, so the, what, what safety requirements do we want to put on a plane? Because there are, there are things you could do to make planes even safer, but eventually you're starting to be like, okay, well now a ticket you know, from New York to LA is gonna cost $20,000 or something like that. So they, they worked out 
there's a formula, and I forget exactly what it is, but it's something like um, they say if you can increase safety by uh, if you can like decrease mortality odds by a certain percentage, it's worth spending this much money to do. So if somebody comes up with a method that'll be like, okay, well we can increase safety by this much, but it costs and it costs more than that, then uh, like the U.S. like the FAA is like, we're not gonna. We're not going to recommend it. The same will eventually be true of space travel. Right now, everything's a case-by-case -case basis. Everything's special, and it's actually really dangerous. We have sent something on the order of between five and six hundred people into space ever total, and on the order of twenty of them have died. That's pretty bad odds. There's a scene in the book where a reporter asks, like, "At what point are we spending too much here to save Watney?" And the answer is, well. There, it's kind of a special case because they're getting an extended Mars mission out of it. So from a strictly, you know, dollars per amount of time spent on Mars, Watney was like this fantastic deal. The trend in space travel over the past few years has been towards privatization. And in the book, it's a NASA mission going to Mars. Do you think it's possible that a private entity, someone like an Elon Musk, is going to actually get to Mars before the government does? Uh, no, I don't think that's possible or likely. Uh, but I do believe that commercial spaceflight will be absolutely critical in the first manned mission to Mars. I think the first manned mission to Mars will be a large international effort, kind of like ISS. And so I think you can expect NASA, Roscosmos, JAXA, ESA, ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, maybe even the Chinese, um, will all work together and and collaborate and, and, and do a manned mission to Mars. And that's going to require some big ass ship put in orbit. Now either you use cyclers or you use ion engines or you use good old fashioned propellant. Either way, you're going to have to put an awful lot of mass in orbit. That's where commercial space flight's going to happen. It'll be messy politics, right? Because it's, you, you'll have a whole bunch of countries involved. So it'll be like, all right, SpaceX gets 17 of the launches, Aristide gets nine, uh, the Russians get four, the, you know, the Japanese get two, you know, whatever, it would be something like that. It, you can think of it as a company that makes widgets in New York and, and wants to sell them in LA, doesn't make their own fleet of trucks, usually. They hire a trucking company to do the transport, and that's what it comes down to. Companies like SpaceX are freight companies, and they'll drive the price down and down and down, and that's the key. Uh, by the way, people have always said like, oh, going to Mars is going to cost, you know, several hundred billion dollars. I don't think it will, because I think by the time we're actually considering it, the price to LEO will have gone down a lot because of commercial space travel. And basically, the price to go to Mars will come down, because that's the main thing, getting things from the surface of Earth to Earth orbit. Um, the price to get to LEO will come down until it reach, and the you know, multi-government cooperation will go up and the amount they're willing to spend on it will go up until there's some, some point at which they say like, okay, it's now 2040 and we're pretty sure we can get humans on Mars f for $50 billion, you know? What is the most compelling case to send uh, a mission to Mars? The real question is why would anybody send a human to Mars? because we have really good robotics technology, we have really good computer AI. Uh, right now, uh, a rover is not as efficient as an astronaut would be, but give us another 20 years of tech, or I tell you what, take some of that $100 billion that it would cost to send humans to Mars and put that into developing the tech, and you will very quickly end up with uh, rovers that are at least as effective as astronauts and have enough AI to make minor decisions on their own. So let me ask the question So then, why, why send, send a, a human, human to Mars? Mars? And the answer is because the rovers are what you want to send to Mars if what you're after is information about Mars. I have a different goal. I want us to have a, a self-sufficient human population somewhere other than Earth. Hmm because 25 years of being a computer programmer has taught me the value of backing things up. And as, as long as our entire species is on one planet, we risk extinction. It's not very likely, but it could happen. It could be a plague, it could be a war, it could be a meteor strike or something like that. But if we're on two planets, it is practically impossible for us to die. Andy Weir, thank you very much for talking to us. Thanks for having me. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller and a half long paddles that use the air around them to create pressurized cushions of air on which the pod can ride. Like, like an air hockey table. 